thanks for the introduction, Rachel. I'm going to try to share my screen. Which was successful once, so hopefully it will be again. Can you I see that? <laughs> Not yet. Oh, I may just have a small delay. Yep, I see it. You're good. OK, well, my name is Sonia Howlett. As Rachel introduced, I work in the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets in the Water Quality Division, and I've been very involved with the Vermont Pay for Phosphorus program development, uh, which will again be rolling out for fall of 2021. So this is kind of a discussion more high level based on the background, why this is new, why it's innovative, and what we're hoping this program will, will do for Vermont and for uh, our goals of reducing phosphorus runoff to lake, which I'm sure you're all interested in at this clean water uh, lecture series. We do have a web page, Vermont Pay for Phosphorus Program it has a web page at the agriculture.vermont.gov website slash VPFP, which is the acronym we're using. And there is some more background there and some frequently asked questions. So I'd encourage you all to check that out. Uh, Today I'm going to be doing a quick overview of the NICS RCPP AFA award that we got, the historical background of what got us here, pavement for performance, why it's different, why it's new, and uh, the Vermont Pay for Phosphorus program, how it fits in, and what our timeline is and what the next steps are that we're, we're looking at kind of in the next year. And I again, this will be pretty high level. If you do have questions kind of related to a specific slide, my understanding is that you can raise your hand and Rachel can kind of stop me and un unmute you and make that happen. But there will be question times at the end uh, and it does kind of build on itself. And I, I hope that I'll be able to answer a lot of your questions over the course of it. So if you're not so sure if I'll answer it, wait and see if I do. Uh, and then we can ask more questions at the end. So uh, big, big picture background, this project, this award that we're doing was one of 10 nationally that was awarded in 2019, 2020. Um, that the funding for this pro project is going to be coming from uh, the US Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, and they are running, they run a number of programs. You might have heard of kind of some of the sister programs in the in Vermont, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, but this is a specific subsection of alternate funding arrangement projects, which basically just means that we as the lead partner are going to be administering this program as well as getting farms into it instead of the normal model, which is NRCS does a lot of the, the administration. So we are the lead partner and it's a five year project uh, starting mid 2021 and going till mid 2026 with a $7 million award over those five years, 4.9 million of which will be given or paid directly to producers uh, through this program. And we're, we're currently still in the midst of the agreement process with NRCS and finalizing that, but these are the award that we've been, been informed of. In terms of the program timeline, we spoke about this already, but it's going, the first applications are going to open in late fall 2021. Uh, it's going to be an annual program uh, and it's going to run essentially for four crop seasons uh, with re-enrollment annually and continued outreach annually. Uh, in the meantime, in 2021, this year, we are already working with a select number of farms that we have just selected to do some conservation innovation grant research. That's a different grant that we got from the Vermont NRCS, and we're going to be asking some more questions around program setup and what it's going to look like with the help of those farms and their, the data that they're going to provide to us. Uh, so that's all very exciting and coming up sooner than any of us will know it's here. Hi, Sonia. Just real quick, are you advancing slides? Because if you I are, am, you're not see them. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm going to end.
just going to share my whole screen. Can you see it now? I'm waiting for it to load. Yes. OK, thanks for for calling that out. Absolutely. It would be a Thank very you. boring PowerPoint without any slides. So uh, bringing back up to where I was, the historical background essentially is there's been over many, many years, a lot of phosphorus and other nutrients, as we know, running into our water bodies, running into our lakes, uh, getting to a point where it became critical and essential to correct. Uh, and kind of that's that's the stage that we've been in for the last couple decades, at least, is, you know, recognizing that a lot of loading had happened in the past and is continuing and slowing down where possible the loading, the phosphorus loading that's happening now and the hopes that future generations will be able to enjoy clean, clean water cleaner than it is now. So as part of that kind of push, the Environmental Protection Agency, as many of you know, has assessed some total maximum daily loads on phosphorus and other nutrients in Vermont. Uh, the biggest, the most commonly heard of one is the Lake Champlain Basin in green here, which has a phosphorus total maximum daily load, but different total maximum daily loads are kind of prevalent and as important across the state. And the uh, DEC and the Lake Champlain Basin program both have some good outreach around you know what TMDLs are, what it looks like, but and essentially they're a diet, a nutrient diet for uh, for the landscape, saying you we cannot put more than this amount of this nutrient into our waterways. So and a really important thing when thinking about these total maximum daily loads is that they're they are they're models, right? So. On agricultural land, as an example, which is where our interests lie, uh, they modeled land uses across the Vermont landscape. Uh, this one for the Lake Champlain um, Basin essentially assumed three types of land use, either corn or hay or a combination of both the rotation. And that is how they came up with their initial estimates of how much loading was happening in order to assign that that reduction the required reductions that different sectors such as agriculture would be would be held to but originally it was it was based in a model and that model uh, assumed that within a certain type of uh, land use that those farms would be doing certain practices and that's how they were able to come up with the numbers that we they gave for how much loading was occurring in this case from agriculture. So, so the TMDL then sets this baseline and then they require various um, sectors to make different amounts of reductions. So many of you have seen this, this graph before, but if we're starting at the top in the top pie graph uh, with those uh, 631 overall metric tons of phosphorus runoff per year. Again, this is the Lake Champlain Basin uh, that we're looking at right now. Agriculture in that in that time period, 2001 to 2010, I believe, was contributing 41% of the loading. And then by the end of the total maximum daily load kind of time frame, which in Lake Champlain Basin is 2038, they said that agriculture would have to go down to 118 metric tons per year, uh, which is a 55% reduction just straight, you know, from one to the next, but also kind of comparing with other sectors, uh, agriculture is reducing more than others. It's reducing 67% uh, that's required by the TMDL uh, out of that 213 metric tons per year of overall reductions that are being asked of, of Vermont, Lake Champlain Basin. 
if look is breaking that down further uh, that there's a wide variation in ranges of what's what's required from from different like segments in the Lake Champlain Basin uh, again average is 53.6 percent reduction but what you know some some are much higher some are much lower if you take out those more extreme values the average is closer to 40 percent uh, if you ignore ignore some of the higher end ones and thinking about kind of why that is why agriculture is being asked to to reduce so much part of it is you know they they did some calculations they figured out it was possible for agriculture to reduce more than other sectors might be able to uh, i believe i heard that uh the reductions from agriculture in the lake champlain basin tmdl were estimated when they put it together to be able to be met just by all farms in the basin becoming compliant with regulations so you know if if they did what the required agricultural practices as an example sets out for them that we would be able to meet that uh, estimated um, required reduction. So that's good good news. And uh, another really good news for agriculture in terms of, of getting reductions do done and on the ground is that it's been showing to be pretty cost effective to make those reductions. So uh, here's a graph from the most recent uh, clean water initiative performance report that DEC pulls together every year and agriculture as you can see has significantly lower cost per kilogram of phosphorus that's kept out of the lake than the other three sectors shown here by in many cases like significantly less right 86 versus as a median versus 234 or even up into the thousands for for road and stormwater what's that been looking like in terms of uh, what we've managed to have happen? Well, we've been growing steadily. The number of phosphorus reductions that we've been able to document has, has grown over the past five years. And we're seeing that a lot of that so far is, is being documented by funding programs, is being documented by assistance programs we're putting out. The, the role of regulatory programs so far has been has been less. And based on these first five years of data and the place we are now agriculture is really shouldering the majority of the um loading that we've been able to demonstrate and there's a couple for re reasons for that one you know agriculture is in a very good place or better place than some of the other sectors to document and to really kind of prove and and be, be account for the uh the reductions that we've been we've been making so that that's certainly contributing and also just there's a there's a tremendous amount of effort going into this um, from our farmers from 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 the state and from feds and our partners uh, and it, it shows in in the reductions we're seeing coming from agriculture however you also may have seen this graph which is uh essentially we've across all sectors gotten to 28.2 um, metric tons per year kept out of the Lake Champlain. The target, of course, is 212.4, as shown in this graph. So we are certainly making progress, but there's certainly a very, very long way yet left to go, right? So then the questions become, you know, how can we step up? How can we get to a place where we're getting closer to that target? What things more can we do that we're not doing now. And of course we could expand the programs we're doing, do that more, but try, trying to add more tools in our toolbox to get ourselves that much closer to our target. And that I think is where a lot of interest in this newer concept that we've started to hear a lot about recently, payment for ecosystem services comes in. So a lot of people call that PES for short, and this definition comes from uh, James Saltzman and his colleagues uh, who uh, that James or Jim Saltzman, Professor Saltzman did come speak to the payment for ecosystem services working group that's currently being held in the state of Vermont. 
uh, and he does a lot of research into kind of what works in PES systems, what are they, what do they look like, and how can they be set up to be effective. Uh, so the ecosystem services are, the, in his definition, the interactions of living organisms with their environment that sustain, or in the conditions and processes that sustain human life, whereas payment for those ecosystem services is a transaction between the landholders and the beneficiaries. So in other words, you know, how do we value the good, the things, the good things, the ecosystem services that land is providing to the rest of us beyond maybe what we're already paying for, like let's say food is an example, um, and how do we translate that value into payments to those people who are managing the land that provides that. So this slide from Taylor Ricketts at the Gunn Institute lays out a couple of the ecosystem services that people think of when they think of that. So, you know, food's one of them, but there's a, a number more, nutrient cycling, photosynthesis, fresh water, climate regulation, moderating extreme events, right? F prevention of flooding. These are all things that land, well-managed land or, you know, natural land or different, different types of land can provide to humans that we have a value in that makes our lives better. And currently, in most situations, the major ecosystem services that are actually compensated to the landowners are, are food and raw materials. Um, sometimes, you know, we get recreation and ecotourism, we have some, you know, some payments can happen there, but mostly food and raw materials are compensated for, and all these other ones are kind of run on benefits that we don't necessarily pay for. And PES says, well, maybe we should. So a number of uh, interested groups have started to think more about this question. You know, how, how can we value those other benefits in a way that we can support landowners, particularly in agriculture, to continue to ensure that their land continues to provide those benefits and or make their land even better provider of those benefits. Uh, three notable ones are the farmer watershed groups that uh, are scattered around the state and they've been starting to think really closely about, about this topic. They've had a, a lot of discussions internally, I know, and they've also been engaging you know, with the state, with, with initiatives we've put together and that they've put them together and, you know, talking to legislators, telling them that this is something really interesting to farmers in Vermont right now. And if anyone has the chance, I'd really recommend that you watch the um, YouTube video of their joint, uh, their joint discussion, their joint PowerPoint, their joint, uh, presentation on the work that they've been doing recently in water quality and agriculture and of uh, you can find it on youtube but it, there is a large emphasis in there on um, payment for ecosystem services and, and and what what that could look like there's also the pes working group that's uh, ongoing it had taken a bit of a hiatus but it's the first uh new meeting for 2021 is going to be occurring i believe on Tuesday, March 16th, it's at uh, 1 p.m. and there are more information and the link to join is on our webpage. Uh, but that group has been starting to think really deeply about payment for ecosystem services. It was put together by the legislature uh, and is diving deep, deep into some of these questions around what PES could look like. Uh, and then there's also a number of CIG, Conservation Innovation Grant initiatives that are taking place in Vermont, trying to gather more information around, around how payment for ecosystem services could look. One of the really important questions that a lot of these groups have started to look into is the question of you know, market-based mechanisms versus program mechanisms. Uh, and basically the idea is there is you're, you're valuing a benefit, right? So there's a landowner that produces a benefit and there's a public or other groups that, you know, 
take the benefit that have the benefit and how how do we compensate the market versus the market based mechanism essentially is looking at multiple buyers who are all competing for a chance to purchase the benefit which in most cases is kind of turned into something tradable in the form of credits so many people are, should be familiar with carbon credits that would be an example of a market based uh, payment for ecosystem services model you could have you know clean water credits you could have you know flooding reduction credits but the idea is that it's quantified and traded a program which is more where the state and federal capacities have lain in the past is more closely akin to a single buyer system right of the program set up the program quantifies the the eco or the ecosystem services it quantifies the benefit it sets a payment scale and it pays based on that so two interesting different ways of looking at it other interesting decisions that and perspectives that these groups have been looking at is the decisions around whether to target towards one specific aspect of ecosystem services or whether they can capture more at once looking a little more holistically and they've been starting to think through these two new terms that have started to come out paying for practice versus paying for performance and the most basic difference there is you know payment for practice is paying based on the implementation what did you do uh, so that's simpler but you know in some cases it's not specifically tied to the environmental benefit whereas payment for performance which is a little more complicated is based on the outcomes it, uh, it's a little harder to tell when you go into it you know what what you're going to get paid but the payment is tied specifically to the actual environmental benefit so you know in in farming an example would be right farmers and our current system are, are paid for their milk that's the outcome they're not paid for their number of cows they have which is closer to the practice right so um, if they you know if their cows each make more milk then they'll get paid more and that's a similar idea for this pay for performance is what comes out is what matters. So that kind of leads us into this Vermont pay for phosphorus program. What does that look like? Where does it fit in this nexus and how does it relate to those other initiatives, those other interest groups that are on the ground now? So it's uh, this is kind of a subsection of the payment for ecosystem services work in Vermont. Everything else is still ongoing and we're really excited to keep engaging with all of those groups. Uh, the Agency of Agriculture just has set this program up kind of learning from some of the uh, research and the learning that's already happened in those other groups as one example of a possible of a, a, a payment for ecosystem services mechanism. Uh, that we're going to put into place but we're really excited to see what those other um, groups like the P pes working group come up with and to support them as they go on towards in general um more a more holistic approach to payment for ecosystem services than than this particular program is going to take so as we started setting up this uh pes program the pay for phosphorus program we were kind of grappling with this pay for practice, pay for performance question until we realized that really there are actually a lot of pay for practice payment for ecosystem services happening in Vermont. This might be my opinion, but I've been looking at through the programs that we run or that our partners run, NRCS, FSA. There are a number of programs kind of related to this clean water work that focuses on paying farmers for improvements to water quality. They're just all tied to practice implementation. Uh, so when we look at pay for performance, there's very little that fits that 
bubble of we're paying for outcomes, partially just because it's a little more complicated. I think the conservation stewardship program is an interesting kind of halfway in between. They do some they do some payments based on outcome and then another portion of the payments based on the practice implementation. But in general, we pay for clean water. It's just based on practices. Looking, this is another slide from the Vermont Clean Water Initiative performance report. Um, this is showing, you know, the sheer number of acres and practices installed uh, across these years. So a, a number, a very significant proportion of, of, of land is being, you know, provided with payment for implementing practices in Vermont. But again, the project output measures, as you can see, if they're acres of practices, acres of practices, number of practices, right? So it's we're the, all of these existing programs are taking this practice based approach and this new program will do something different, but it's not intended to supplant. It's not intended to replace these practice based payments. It's just intended to be a new different way of looking at it that maybe will provide another tool an that will complement these existing programs. So we're we took, went with the pay for performance approach uh, and some interesting risks, some interesting pros and cons there, but it will be very exciting to see what that looks like in practice. The other uh, big decision that is pretty apparent from the title is we did choose to focus on just one ecosystem service, namely P reductions. Uh, in part just to get the program off the ground that we are open to potentially incorporating more uh, complex approaches in the future but to get it started we just want, decided to go for simpler uh, and easier to calculate uh, with then you know soil health it's kind of hard to figure out and narrow down on what exactly you're going to be looking at there which is what the working group is is working towards and then the other interesting part of that is it can be a lot easier to value. So if we're looking at phosphorus reductions, we have numbers for how much money the state of Vermont and our partners are putting into creating phosphorus reductions, right? So this, if you're thinking about payment for ecosystem services, assigning a value to a benefit, phosphorus reductions have a kind of value that we, don't necessarily think of that way, but we have a amount of money that we've been willing to put forwards to make these projects happen. So we've been thinking and developing this program, but this um, Clean Water Initiative performance report and the kind of payment scales that we're seeing would be a good touchstone to kind of assure, ensure that the valuation we're putting on phosphorus reductions is in keeping with the amount of of money that we've been willing to spend on phosphorus reductions. We're just going to, in this program, kind of more directly tie that to the outcomes we're seeing on the ground. So again, the, we've seen this before, but it's a transaction between landholders and the beneficiaries of the service their land provides. So this new program essentially is going to really simplify down that that transaction between the landholders and the beneficiaries. We'll put a value on phosphorus reductions per pound and we'll deliver that to the landholders who are providing that benefit. So that brings us to kind of the meat of this this program. It's innovative because it's pay for performance, which we haven't seen as far as I can find out in Vermont before. And it's going to be paying on the, our results that it could improve cost effectiveness. It could accelerate implementation and it makes it more flexible for farms to manage fields how they choose. So one of the beauties of this uh, pay for performance approaches is um, compared to pay for practice, right? If there's two fields that are of identical size, but you know, different soil type, different slope, the pay for phosphorus will pay more if one of those fields by, let's say, cover cropping, if, if, they, if you cover crop both fields and one of them, that cover crop reduces phosphorus runoff more, that 
farmer who owns that field will be paid more for cover cropping than the farmer who may have owned the other field and was and the cover cropping was uh, less effective there. So it's a really interesting new shift in kind of how payments will will occur and, and what that will look like, but it's very exciting to know that the benefit that you're paying on is actually happening. So in developing this program, there were a number of goals that we were kind of focusing on uh, that I'm going to run through quickly and how we believe this program is is achieving those those goals. The first one, of course, is farmer buy in, right? We can't we can't run a, a program based on agriculture that's paying farmers without making sure that the farmers are interested in this approach and that they feel like they're being that their conservation is being valued appropriately and that this program will serve the needs they have as well as the needs we have. So that was a really important goal. Another really important goal that we had was that we would have verifiable, calculable, and location-specific outcomes. So quantifiable outcomes, basically. How do we have outcomes of phosphorus reductions that we can actually put a number on to pay? If it's just vague, there's there's nothing we can do there. And the way we manage to uh, attempt to get at that is we're going to be using the farm prep model. So this is a model that was developed, or it was based on an NRC or a USDA uh, background model, but it was calibrated for Vermont with data from Vermont farms and from Vermont researchers. So very tied to, to, to this place that we're in, specific to Vermont. And this model will allow us to assign um, field-specific phosphorus load reduction estimates for each farm and for each field. And uh, farmers will be paid kind of on the net balance across their farm. They'll be uh, asked to put their entire farm's data into this model and they'll be uh, paid based on the overall reductions on their total farm. So one huge benefit of, of this tool in particular is that it gives, it's a really important planning tool in my opinion that farms can use because by modeling you can put in the practices that you're interested in doing and see how the phosphorus runoff reductions will look if you do those uh, do those practices that you think that you could do. Uh, so it gives a lot of autonomy to the farmer in terms of choosing their practices, and it gives a lot of flexibility based on where those practices go on their farm. If they don't want to do that practice, there's another maybe there's another one that'll get them to a similar level of of stewardship. Uh, and so that I think is a really huge value of, of this model in uh, in being useful and being kind of back to the farmer buy-in, giving people, giving landowners the opportunity to see how their how their management will turn out uh, and to make choices themselves around around where where their their efforts best spent. The other um, important goal kind of I alluded to a lot earlier in this presentation is we're trying to uh, develop a way to help ourselves meet however we can that those total maximum daily loads. Uh, and so this program is going to be very tied to that total maximum daily load where our goal is to uh, compare the management of farms currently against the assumed management over, over the total maximum daily load so that we can ensure that the reductions we're calculating and, and valuing in that way are very specifically tied to uh, the TMDL uh, and, and, the, and the assumptions that they, they made there. I think another benefit of that approach is it uh, since the TMDL assumptions were essentially a baseline and they were spread 
uh, across farms. It didn't really take into account what uh, what farms were or weren't doing in the moment. It was more of an average level of stewardship assumed at the time. This using this approach allows us to advantage farms that are have been stewarding their land well for a very long time. Right, a lot of current uh, programs that we run have pla place an emphasis on improvements, right? What did you do last year? Did you do better this year? And that we've realized to kind of cuts out people who might have been doing very high, high levels of stewardship over many, many years, and therefore feel like, you know, they did that on their own dime back in 1996, and that now, you know, their their neighbors are, are getting paid to do it, what, what they implemented on their own all that time ago. So I think that's a really exciting aspect of this program as well. Uh, the really important thing though is, is making sure that the stewardship we're paying for is additional, right? Is it, how is it going above and beyond? How is it more than what we would normally expect of a farm to do, right? There's some, the TMDL requires that agriculture has a reduction. We have some required agricultural practices. You know, how do we ensure that the payments are based on above and beyond an exemplary stewardship rather than maybe just what we might expect from, from a farm? So the kind of solution we've come to there is we're going to have a threshold that we're going to set saying like this percentage of reductions from your farm's baseline is what we would expect a normal farm to do. If you're doing more than that, you're an above average farm doing more than we should have been expecting of you. And therefore we can pay you additional, or we can pay you for those additional re reductions. So that's going to be uh, the the mechanism there. And then another really important question we've been starting to think about is like, okay, well, that's all well and good, but you know, how much do we pay? And how do we make sure that it's enough? How do we make sure that it's worth it to be part of this program? Uh, and, you know, you're not like losing money right and left, trying to keep up with, keep up with all the things we're asking of you. And it's, it's not going to, get you anywhere in a, anywhere in a better place. So we're trying to work towards sufficiency of payment. And that's something we're still working out and we're going to be having discussions with stakeholders uh, in, in the coming year to kind of try to figure out what that looks like, you know, how much a pound of phosphorus should be worth and how is that going to motivate people to, to do this conservation. And I think finally the, the last and most important goal we've had is making sure that this the program is equitable and efficient so equity right fair efficient making the most phosphorus reductions basically uh and those in some cases are, are a bit of a trade-off right so in general the largest phosphorus reductions will happen on the largest farms because they have managed the most land and we recognize that and we also want to make sure that small farms can be involved as well so that's one example of a trade-off there. And we've worked through a couple of different ways that we're gonna try to get there. Uh, the first, or one of them is we're gonna offer two payment types. So we're gonna have a data entry payment, which is going to compensate farms for their time entering their data into the farm prep software. This is only gonna be paid one time, but it's gonna, our hope is that this will make it worthwhile to kind of sit down and put all your farm's data into a, a program, not knowing what your phosphorus payment's going to look like, right? So that's a risk of wasting your time. And it's just a lot of time for people who in the current world are mostly only compensated for producing food. So if you're not producing food, your time at the current moment isn't really being valued. So we're, our goal is to offer that data entry payment um, $15 an acre with a relatively small cap at $4,000 just to make reduce the barriers to entry to this program. And then beyond that, we'll be having that payment for phosphorus that we've kind of focused more on in this lecture. That'll be the vast majority of the funds that we're laying out, but we'll be focused on the phosphorus reductions resulting from each year's management. And that'll be paid per pound of phosphorus 
considering the cost of the state of P reductions and uh, will be ver and the practices will be verified prior to payment to make sure that what's in that system, what's being modeled actually matches what's on the ground so that the number we come out with, we're very confident represents the actual management of that farm. Some other interesting equity questions, you know, are, are around caps, right? Is it, where do we set caps? Uh, how do we get more farms in? How do we get farms across the state involved? And so we did decide to have this be a statewide program to kind of improve that equity aspect to make sure that everyone's uh, eligible. Uh, and we'll be having, um, at the same time, right? Okay, well, ev everyone across the state will be eligible. We want everyone to be able to access this, but some lake segments, um, some watersheds are are more at risk of phosphorus specifically than others. So we're going to be addressing that with a, um, a funding pool model. So 60% of our funding will go to the Lake Champlain Basin, 20% as we as we have it planned to meant for Magog, and another 20% to rest of state. Right, so that's the efficiency. We're trying to try to focus funds where that phosphorus is uh, most of concern, but we're still going to try to make everyone be able to access. And then we'll be also doing ranking kind of within those funding pools to prioritize some other elements. You know, the highest levels of stewardship will be prioritized if you're if you're achieving the most reductions. That'll be prioritized, for example. So kind of thinking what that looks like in a year uh, in the fall winter in the winter uh, they'll be you know doing farms will be doing paperwork entering data in farm prep uh, and if if you were enrolled the re year before that's when you would have been paid for that kind of throughout the spring you'd be farms would be continuing that that data entry and starting to farm starting to implement the spring practices uh, and over the course of the spring, summer and fall, the, our, our partners will be, our contracted partners will be verifying those practices and making sure that the uh, data lines up with the model, make sure it's all uh, clean, all clear. And then by November, December, we'll be kind of finishing up one year, gathering the information we have, getting ready to send out payments in the following um, you know, following quarter and also starting to enroll new farms, accept new applications and make sure that any farms who were participating the year before who want to participate the next year can also get back in. Uh, kind of in the short term, uh, we've been starting to think too about the uh, co our conservation innovation grant and that research initiative that I mentioned earlier. So we're working with um, 12 to 14 farms at the moment and we are uh, going to be putting some of their data into farm prep, into that model to see what it looks like, see if there's any kind of wrinkles we need to work out, uh, make some edit. We're going to be making some edits to farm prep with um, Stone Environmental as a co the contractor we'll be using for that to uh, make sure it matches all the goals of our program and that uh, it's easier to use and that it's calculates what we need it to calculate. Uh, and over the course of this year, we'll also be getting important feedback from those those farms around, um, you know, their experience and, and what they, they think could be improved. Some really key questions that we don't know the answer to yet that CIG is going to help us with is, you know, what's, what's reasonable for us to pay for one pound of phosphorus? Uh, how, how do the loading re reductions and the potential payments in farm prep differ? And how does that differ by field? Uh, how does that differ by what you're growing on your field? Um, that we have some ideas, but we're, we're still trying to get some more data there so we can give better estimates to, to interested farmers around what that could look like. And then also what other decisions do we need to make that we haven't really, might not have thought of yet to ensure that the pay for, perform, or pay for phosphorus program meets our goals. Uh, so that's a huge one, right? Open-ended. What what else is there that we might not have thought of yet? Again, that's all going to happen this year, and then the program will be annual after that uh, until our um, funding, our grant 
uh, ends in 2026. Again, I'd encourage everyone to visit the web page at um, agriculture.vermont.gov slash BPFP. There's a lot more information on there and a lot of what I already went over today. Uh, and if you have kind of specific questions that today might not be the best, the best time to ask, you're welcome to get in contact with me up at the number here at the email uh, or any of the other team members uh, Ryan, Nina, and Judson are all really great contacts uh, and would be happy to answer your questions. But for now, I'll, I'll answer any any questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we did have some great conversations started in the chat. Uh, one of the first questions that came up was, how is this program being shared throughout Vermont, not just the shared water body in the Lake Champlain Basin? Uh, that could have two interpretations, so maybe I'll try to answer both. We haven't started outreach um, that much for enrolling farms for this program, uh, but we will. We do intend to work with our partners who work across Vermont and to put that in ag review once it once it does roll out for applications in terms of outreach um, and in terms of uh, you know people enrolling it, it, again it will be statewide it will be a statewide program and uh, we hope that we get a, a variety of farms across the state to enroll thank you um we had also a great amount of conversation about uh very specific questions about the um like stacking practices and um i don't know let's see i'm just gonna look through which ones haven't been answered? Um, are farm fields that are not owned by a farmer but rented eligible for practices implemented by a farmer as an incentive for the landowner to encourage implementation of practices? We've been discussing that question. I'm not, I don't think we've come to a really solid place on it, and I'm hoping CIG might give us some more answers. But we, I do know that in when we're the state of Vermont is assessing nutrient management plans, which a lot of this information might be coming from because it relies on similar data. Um, we do consider, you know, a farm to include any rented land that that farm is using. So I, I do know that we, 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 we do consider that to be land, often consider that to be land under a farm's management. Awesome. Um, the pay for performance approach is compelling um, for on-farm practices. Some edge of field practices such as restoration of wetlands, floodplains, and vegetated buffers can help to substantially reduce nutrient runoff. Um, how will these be valued and compensated for under the pay for performance approach? Yeah, that's a really good question. So as it stands, this pay for phosphorus approach is going to be very specifically targeted towards um, cropland and hayland. And I probably should have mentioned that earlier. So we, we are hoping that in the future we could potentially revisit um, incorporating more land uses. One of those, of course, is, is pasture, uh, but we're pretty tied by what's the farm prep model is currently able to, to model, which is pretty focused on that cropland and hayland. Um, and again, I, I want, want to reiterate that a, a lot of this program is not trying to supplant or replace uh, other programs. So I do know there are some good, some good other more practice based programs in, in those areas specifically around wetland restoration. So it'll hopefully all mesh together. But yes, we do not at as it stands. Incorporate uh, non field based practices. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question is, are partners with boots on the ground responding to an RFP for work with the Agency of Ag on this, or is it funded through RCPP or alternative funding mentioned before? So yes and yes, it will be fun. The partner, we will be uh, putting out RFPs for partners and the funding for those RFPs will come from the AFA 
agreement that we have. So NRCS is, will be providing us funding to support verification, to support farms getting their data in here. And we'll put it, we'll, we will be putting out publicly uh, RFP to try to find qualified um, qualified organizations who can who can do that work. Great. Uh, another question is when determining if a practice is above threshold, is that a farm specific threshold based on their current management or a general threshold estimated across the board for farms? So the threshold will be um, up, the same threshold will be applied across all farms uh, and then each individual farm will be held to a percentage reduction. So uh, again, that's that's kind of an equity based uh, thing is having that that percentage reduction be be similar across farms. If if a farm for whatever reason, based on its soil type, slope, other kind of characteristics, has a really high assumed loading, then that threshold being based on a percentage will be um, maybe leave a little more room for 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 reductions to happen and be paid on. But uh, the percentage will be the same from farm to farm. Great. Um, are corn, hay, other field crops contributing more towards pea runoff than dairy? If so, what degree? So again, this is a field based program. I think um, many dairy farms, uh, in, at least in the state of Vermont, do have those um, those field practices as well, right? So they have the cows and they have the field practices, but this program is going to really focus on the field practices. Um, I, I'm not sure if what the question was asking, but I, I don't personally know the breakdown between, let's say, like, you know, manure pits versus field. I'm sure many other people on this call would know that answer, but I do not. Okay, um, we have a question about how much phosphorus in total will be removed through this program as an estimate or a, uh, idea? We do not have a very good estimate yet, and we're really hoping that we will have a better idea by the time that CIG project I spoke of is completed, and we have a bit more kind of data at our fingertips on seeing what what farms what farms are looking like in this program. Great. Um, what are the plans to monitor compliance and farmer responsibilities? So the plan, so the responsibilities of the farm will be to work with us on their own, their TSP or a partner to get their data into farm prep, make sure it's accurate and make sure that over the course of the year it stays accurate. So if they said that they were going to put, let's say, put on a cover crop and then it didn't work out because it was too wet and they didn't, their responsibility will be to go in or to work with someone else to go in and to change that so it matches. So that will be the responsibility of the farm. And then the verification will occur by our partners kind of comparing the outputs of, of farm prep, comparing you know what practices were implemented where with you know on the ground observation of was there a cover crop there? Yes, no. You know, was did this field actually get manure injected or was it spread on top? That that's the kind of verification that will be happening. Great. Um, we do have a couple more minutes and we do have a raised hand. I'd like to invite James Maroney to unmute and ask your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Sonia. Um, uh, uh, farmers um, apply phosphorus uh, in order to boost corn yields um, and uh, with on the theory that that corn uh, produces more milk um, and they want more milk because they want more income. But the uh, the industry is losing four dollars a hundred weight uh, right now, which works out to an industry wide loss of 80 million a year. Um, your program, the payment for echo services uh, is going to offer them uh, eight million dollars over a five year period, if I understand you correctly, which is about 10 percent of their annual loss. Um, 
uh, how how does that uh, how does that attract farmers? How can you rephrase the question? How does what attract farmers? The farmers are losing eighty million a year right now, and your program is asking them to reduce uh, phosphorus, for which they're going to compensate them eight million dollars over a five year period. That that's just ten percent of their annual loss. Why would the, why would a why would a farmer be interested in that in that uh, program? In other words, if they if they cut their phosphorus, uh, they're going to lose production. Why would they do that? Yeah, I think there's uh, that's definitely an interesting question. Um, I think one of the appeals that I've heard from farmers about the this type of a program is that I think farmers. I mean, farmers want to be profitable, right? They want a good milk price. They want to be able to support their families. That's a given, right? But they also want to know that they're stewarding their lands well. Many do, at least. And so I think that there's an appeal here. There's the monetary appeal, sure. Very important to value benefits and to be able to translate to the, that to the benefits that, or translate that value to the farmers, but I think there's also a huge appeal of this type of program in terms of a, a beyond monetary value, like recognizing where phosphorus runoff is happening on your farm and what you can do about it, right? That modeling tool, the farm prep tool, I think is a really great uh, kind of management tool that farms will be able to use through this program to achieve their own goals that they have of being more conservation like minded being being able to meet their own their own goals they have for themselves of making their farms more sustainable uh, so i think interesting sonia excuse me uh, a, a, a typical vermont farmer milking 100 cows is making 2 million pounds of milk that's 20,000 hundredweights he's losing $80,000 a year are you suggesting to me that his interest in being a good uh, a good land steward is more important to him than figuring out how to stop that that loss? He needs I'm, to stop that law. Eighty thousand dollars a year, and he's working fifteen hours a day, three hundred sixty five days a year, and you're offering him a, f a few thousand dollars. If he cuts back on his phosphorus application, he's going to lose production. I think that's, that, why he, that's why he that's why he uh, by the way, uh, the farmer's biggest contribution, the, his biggest use of phosphorus is feed is imported feed. If he cuts back on phosphorus. He's going to lose production. What do you recommend the farmer does? Uh, it's not that it's I, I don't know what the farmer would do because I can't understand how they're surviving now. But what I would suggest is, is that since the, the, the state is looking at, I mean, by your own numbers, the base load is 500 metric tons, approximate round numbers. We're now putting in 800 metric tons. That's 300 too much of which Jerry's contribution is 200. That's this, that's where we get the 66 percent. The, the problem is not runoff, Sonia, it's put on. The farm, the, the, the state not needs to uh, help the farmers realize that they can't put any phosphorus on their soil and they can't import any phosphorus into the state. That's why the lake is polluted and that's why the state, the farmers are losing money. Hi folks, we are out of time. Sonia, if you want to do a quick response, but um, we're going to have to close up pretty soon. And thank you everyone for attending and please feel free to leave as you need. Yeah, I think my major comment there is, you know, that this this uh, program is going to be what is one of many, right? This is not the one thing that we're doing now. Um, it's going to build on the other pro all the other programs that exist in the state, all the other PES mechanisms that are being investigated, and on you know the various other mechanisms, maybe regulatory, maybe. Um, you know, compliance related, outreach related, that that we're that we're doing, that the state is doing, that various sectors are doing, and so it, it's by no means intended to be a standalone 
uh, project, it's intended to build to add another tool. And I think that's really important to recognize. Awesome. Thank you, Sonia. That was wonderful. Um, and everyone, thank you for attending. And I will let everybody know when this link and uh, recording is available to see. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the sun. Yes, thanks all.